your malfunction. Didn't mommy and daddy show you enough attention when you were a child? Let's play this backwards and see if it gets any better. Let's get down to business. What do you say? Show me the money! Show me the money! Always be closing. Always be closing. You're now listening to Boots to Business with Daniel Rabowski. And thank you for joining me today. This is Boots to Business, and I am your host, Daniel Rabowski. Uh, the intent of today's show is to kind of start to build up some stuff here that we want to focus on. Uh, the first being what it's like for a lot of service members to transition out of the service into the civilian world and what that looks like and what kind of skill sets they, they bring. Uh, the first segment of our show today is brought to you by Insurance Claims Headquarters. Insurance Claim Headquarters, powered by the Hare Shannara Trial Attorneys. Our commitment is to help make you whole again after a disaster. Call 844-252-4684 or visit insuranceclaimhq.com. This is a non-paid spokesperson for their office in Jacksonville. So again, welcome everybody. My name is Daniel Robowski. I am a prior service Army veteran. I did three tours in Iraq and one tour in Afghanistan between 2001 and 2012. Um, For the longest time, I spent a lot of effort in staying out of the spotlight and becoming kind of an anti-veteran. It wasn't until I started to see a lot of the guys that I served with struggle with how they fit into the civilian world, how that looks for them as far as the skill set and being able to transition a lot of those things over into something that the civilian world could understand. So as I became a little bit more well-versed in the entrepreneurial side of things, uh, I started to be able to identify what a lot of these skills that um, a lot of service members have and how we can, how we can transition them over. So um, as we kick off this first episode, uh, I want to emphasize a, a couple things that will carry through into every single episode moving forward. The first being that veterans are incredibly valuable assets in the workforce. Um, I think sometimes there's a stigma around what that looks like and how do you integrate uh, a lot of these guys into your workplace, into your operation, whether it's a small scale company or a large uh, corporate entity. Um, The focus that we want to shine a little bit of light on is going to be that marriage between um, those skills that these guys bring when they leave the service and then what it looks like to develop those skills and refine them in the civilian workplace. So keep in mind, um, a lot of times when we have veterans coming into the workforce, whether they were in for three years, five years, 10 years, uh, myself, I did 11 and was medicaled out. We have guys that have done a full 20 and they come out and they get out in all different ranks. They had different positions. Their jobs were all different. And we want to keep in mind that they're not just transitioning from military service. They're, they're trying to transition into impactful roles in a business that helps that business grow. They want to be a facilitator to growth. They want to be able to feel that sense of accomplishment. They want to have a task that they can achieve. They want to see others grow with them. And so as we kind of move through week to week here, there's always going to be this underlying theme, right? That we want to help define the qualities and the skills that can be utilized. So if you're an employer looking for um, to fill a space in your company and you see veterans doing the application process, we want to be able to identify how to make, how to marry those skill sets, how to manage um, the expectations, how to avoid certain stigmas that these guys bring into your your space potentially, um, and then exploit the things that they do well, things that are ingrained in them, things that we've been able to over years become experts at. So we want to focus on things like um, discipline. You know, it's, it's that starts from day one when they when they first enter the service, their first day at boot camp or basic training or whatever branch they served in. Day one starts with discipline, and they they can translate that skill into 
an expectation. So if I'm an employer and I see these guys coming in and I know that I have a prior service person and they are looking to set a standard, there's, they're still living in that space in their brain that they can provide a, uh, a functional, um, person into, into a space, right? So when we talk about discipline, we see that that can easily translate into punctuality, a strong work ethic, um, a commitment to certain tasks, right? So a lot of times you'll see service members will get tasked with a job. Um, they're usually left to their own devices to be able to accomplish that task, but the task gets done and it's usually done within the confines that are presented in front of them. So you can take that and then you can nurture it into what every veteran kind of falls, finds themselves falling into is that natural leader position. And I think it's easy to, as an employer, to look into a space and say, okay, these guys manage people in the military, especially if you were an NCO or if you were an enlisted or an officer. Um, it's easy to look at these guys and say, oh, they manage people. But what does that look like? Um, I know as an NCO, when I was in, you know, at any point, I could be in charge of four guys up to 40 guys, right? And we had to be so ingrained into their lives because we had to be able to eliminate distractions. If we were going to take guys into combat zones and we were going to take guys into these austere environments and, and gals, we want to make sure that we are limiting the amount of distractions. So we have to, we, we would always have to be involved in their finances. We had to be involved in their, their family care plans. We had to be involved in any marital disputes, any mom or dad issues. We were counselors to these these kids essentially, right? So when you talk about how does a, a service member who is an NCO or an officer transition their skill set out into the civilian world, um, it, one of the things is that we have to take into account and it needs to be considered is that the level of involvement that these guys had to their subordinates while they were in service is so inherently low compared to what you will find in a normal day-to-day -day workplace. So when we're identifying these people and trying to, to, to validate some of their, their skill sets, um, there is a space there where we look at them as natural leaders. And some of them grew into that, but for, by and large, a lot of these people, it's a cycle. So they cycle into leadership because of the environments and, and the situations that they found themselves in. What you get out of somebody like that is somebody who knows how to inspire and motivate teams to achieve their goals and their objectives and the tasks that you might have in front of them. And then you'll see that that leadership quality and the, the um, endearing personality traits that these people carry will ripple um, through the workplace. You'll see them positively influencing team dynamics in what they do. So there's, there's a lot to be said for the kind of homegrown leadership that the military provides um, and nurtures into these uh, spaces. So another skill that they bring in is adaptability. They, you know, you have to, you cannot glaze over the fact that these guys under very short notice, under very short time frames, can be called to go anywhere in the world at any given time, face whatever situation they may find themselves in, and there's a certain skill set that comes with that. It's the ability to desensitize yourself from outside noise. It's the ability to adapt and thrive under pressure. Um, and in high paced corporate environments, that skill set is, it, it just falls into place seamlessly. It's an invaluable trait that, that a lot of service members carry that I think is commonly overlooked. So, and lastly, we live in a space where teamwork um, in the, in a lot of corporations nowadays, there, everything's done in groups and teams and, and the size of these teams varies from three to 30, right? Um, they are no strangers to a team environment. Um, we live in a constant, um, growth pattern with veterans where they're constantly trying to improve. They're trans constantly trying to bring the people up around them and that fosters camaraderie. Um, it, it, it creates a sense of, of belonging and a sense of unity that a lot of times translates into collaborative and productive work environments. This is this, we can see this in the increase of efficiency when, when these things are actually implemented. So, um, to put it very simply, 
Uh, veterans bring a very unique blend of discipline, leadership, adaptability, and teamwork to the workplace. They are not just employees. They're assets who can drive success in any organization. And so as we are kind of wrapping up this first segment and we're going to roll into the next one, I want to I want to sit and, and leave you guys with this little nugget that we're going to spend some time in the next segment talking about how they impact team dynamics. This is a space that veterans thrive in. This is a space that um, I, I cannot stress the importance enough because 95% of the things that veterans face in, the, in their time and service will ultimately involve them being on a team. And we want to spend some time talking about how that dynamic goes. So setting the stage. Next up, next portion of the show will be Veterans Impact on Team Dynamics. We now return to Boots to Business with Daniel Rabowski. And welcome back. This is segment two of Boots to Business, and I am your host, Daniel Rabowski. Uh, before we proceed, I want to acknowledge our other sponsor, Shield Tech Roofing Solutions. Shield Tech Roofing Solutions is a trusted name in the roofing industry, serving nationwide in the Caribbean. They specialize in a comprehensive range of roofing services, including TPO, PVC, and single-ply commercial roofing, modified bitumen, tile, metal, shingle roofs, and advanced roof coatings and liquid-applied roofing systems. For a reliable roofing professional who can address a wide spectrum of roofing needs, consider Shield Tech Roofing Solutions at their website, www.shieldtechroofing.com, to explore their services further. So welcome back again. My name is Daniel Robowski. And we are on the second segment of today's episode, and we are going to focus on veterans' impact on team dynamics. So we kind of left the first segment talking about how a lot of the military is is phenomenal when it comes to ingraining certain skill sets into their their members, right? And then eventually these guys are going to get out, and they have to figure out how to transfer those skills into a workplace and by and large i think a lot of times when you go to the job fairs that that the military did i know when i got out i was stationed at fort carson colorado and um, we would go to the srp site which for those of you who are in know what that is for those who were not in um it's a soldier readiness um processing i don't remember what the p is but either way it is where all of your in and out processing goes, whether you're coming back from a deployment or whether you're leaving for a deployment, whether you're getting out of the military, if you just arrived at that duty station, whatever it is. So you'd go to the SRP site, there is a job fair going on. And a, and a lot of times it was, you know, it was Walmart, it was Amazon, it was, you know, uh, McDonald's and Burger King and a lot of very, what you would consider entry level positions, but then mixed in there, you would see, um, randomly you want to be a state farm insurance agent you want to own your own office you want to do work for all state you want to work for usa there was a weird um draw into the insurance world for prior service people the conflict that exists there is that i i applied for them when i first got out and i took their personality assessments and as much as they wanted to say that they wanted these prior service folks to come in massively, massively failed the personality exam. And I know of a handful of other people who did the same thing. And they said, well, you don't have the personality traits that we would like to see in one of our business owners. And so you kind of get this slap in the face by a company who, and multiple companies for that matter, that said, I want to hire people of your caliber. I want to hire people that have been through the things that you've been through, but not like that right? Not the way that you are. I want people like you, but not you. So then we're, then you get stuck where you're sitting here saying, okay, well, how do I, how do I translate the skills that I have into viable skills that a workplace is looking for? And the military is horrible at resume writing. And it's one of the requirements when you get out and you have to do this two day course on how to write a resume. And they take all these keywords and put them into a machine for you. And they say, well, when you say I, I was a platoon sergeant, we want to use words like upper management, skilled in leadership development and you know whatever. And unfortunately, it becomes so cookie cutter that every service member was, was reciting those same things 
And so then the job pool gets shrunk. The The amount of people who um, were receiving, on the receiving end of the, those application pools for job offers diminished. And it became more about the college degree plan. And it became more about um, who fit from a personality perspective more than it did who brought the right skills to the table. And as a business owner and um, somebody who is in upper management in the company, there's, there is a weird space dynamic that has to exist there where you, you want to hire people based on all the, the pretty words that are on their resume. But if there's a personality clash or there's a conflict when it comes to um, the intermingling of people and teams, you have, to, you have to be able to identify that. And I think that's where service members thrive is the, the back end of that. It is being able to plug them into a team. It is being able to say, I can put Johnny in this spot and I know that he's not going to disrupt the team. If anything, he's going to be a catalyst to their success. He may not check all the boxes that we were looking for from a resume perspective. He may not be the, um, the ideal candidate for, for what we're talking about, but he is a, he is a, a piece to that puzzle that makes the whole thing come together. So when we're talking about these things and we're looking at potential candidates for jobs, or if you are a veteran who is getting out and you're looking at how do you, how do you enter a workplace that's not just bagging groceries? How do you, how do you become a guy who's not just pushing a button making widgets, right? You want to, I want to have a job that actually means something. And so pitch those skills, pitch the skills of how well you work together in a team environment, pitch those skills and how you have X amount of time and leadership experience and um, how you understand your spot in that team. And you're not trying to overflow and play bumper cars into everybody else's wheelhouse. Those are the skills that employers are looking for. Those are the skills that are going to allow you to separate yourself from the, the rest of the people in that pool. And, you know, we, we sit here and we talk about these things all the time. And I think there's a, there's a weird stigma that exists where the idea is service members are just good at taking orders. And that's so vastly inaccurate. And I think it diminishes what the real skill set is. And I've written a couple articles about this in the past where we talk about how veterans are primed to be entrepreneurs and not necessarily sole proprietors, not necessarily people who are going to go start their own business and, and live in that space. But you can be an entrepreneur and have partners. You can be an entrepreneur and live in a, in a space where you are constantly interacting with people and playing off each other's skill sets. It does not mean you're isolated on an island. It does not mean that you are going to forever be alone and try to navigate the, the wild blue yonder on your, uh, by yourself. That's not the case. Veterans are prepped to be entrepreneurial in, a, in, in the right space with the right conditions. And when they are given all of the tools and they're given the ability to thrive, whether that's in a team environment or by themselves with a goal in mind, they will achieve it and they will achieve it effectively and efficiently. And that's something I think that very often gets overlooked and they we can, a lot of veterans get put in that box of, well, he's just good at taking orders. Well, she's just going to we can count on her to be punctual because she was in the service. I can tell you that the 11 years that I was in, there were more people that would be really bad baggers of groceries at Walmart. But because they wore the uniform, they kind of got that free pass a little bit, right? So there's, there's valid um, arguments to be made in either direction. But for people who are willing to, to go through the pain and the struggle and the, and the learning of these things and ap the, the applicability of these um, skills, they're going to be able to go out into the civilian workforce and be effective. And for a lot of these people, they were leaders. A lot of these people were in leadership positions. You start at a leadership position in some jobs two years in. At 20 years old, you're in charge of another person, right? In, an, in potentially an environment that you're taking them to combat. So I remember I got promoted to E5 at 22 years old. I was all of a sudden in charge of a bunch of dudes who we were going to war. And I was 22 years old. I didn't know anything. I'd been there before. And that was the only experience that separated me from them. 
But what it did show was that collectively as a team, we could all come together and we could do things and we could accomplish whatever tasks that we needed to have. Sometimes it was ugly, but it got done. And sometimes in business, that's the same thing. Sometimes it's just a task that needs to get done. Problem solving has to kick in. We now return to Boots to Business with Daniel Rabowski. Hello, hello, and welcome to the third segment of Boots to Business. My name is Daniel Rabowski. I am your host for today. And this segment is brought to you by Golden Temple Builders. Golden Temple Builders brings decades of expertise to commercial renovations and remodeling. Our commitment is clear, written pricing options tailored to your project. You can visit us at goldentemplebuilders.com for more details or call 321-508-0815. Let's build your vision together, serving Florida, Texas, and Louisiana. All right, so now we're going to start into segment three, and we're going to focus a little bit. We kind of left the, the tail end of the second segment talking about how the teamwork dynamic works for veterans moving into the civilian workspace. Um, and I want to kind of touch on something for a second is that the, the, the premise of this show, and this is the first episode, so we're kind of laying some groundwork, um, is to kind of live half and half in a space where we're talking about a lot of things when it comes to veterans and service members and how that transition looks out, um, but then also into just standard business stuff. So we want to live in a space where we're saying we're talking about how to develop leaders, how to um, how to properly assess and assign KPIs and OKRs. I mean, we're going to live in this big bubble that is a, a weird combination of mar- um, military service and normal corporate business structure stuff. So um, this segment is more about problem solving in the workplace. And so this we're going to kind of transition this segment into segment four and five about we're going to live in a space kind of right dead down the center. The first two segments were very military oriented. This one is going to kind of leapfrog into the other. So we're going to talk about problem solving abilities. The, I want to emphasize the importance of this. So every day, no matter what, what business you're in, no matter what your industry is, no matter what, if you produce a tangible item or if you're, you know, like me, we're a public insurance adjuster. So a lot of what we do is, the work product that we produce is mainly um, going to be arguments, going to be negotiation, it's going to be understanding settlement offers and being able to read policies and all this stuff. Every single day, there is a problem that needs to be solved. And service members are really good at figuring this out because every day for them is a problem. From the day they joined service, did, and when I joined, it was still black boots and green BDUs. So we had to shine our boots. You had to start your uniform. You had to... um, you know, depending on what your headgear was, I was in right there at the transition. Um, and for anybody listening that was in at about the same time, we were right there when General Shinseki decided that the entire army needed to wear black berets. And it was the most ridiculous thing that ever happened. And the day we got rid of it, you know, seven or eight years later was was a joyous day in the army. Um, point being, was your rack tight? Was your wall locker cleaned up and, and, and organized? Was the floor buffed? Was the bathrooms cleaned? Like, the military was really good at creating problems for these guys to solve. And they do it every single day until it becomes muscle memory. You can apply that same thought process and that same line of thinking to the the civilian workplace and saying, okay, every day we need to make a hundred widgets. So how do we make these? And what are the potential problems that we could run across throughout the day? Right. Did was the right amount of materials ordered was the, was the right amount of people on the schedule? When was the last time the machines were maintenanced? When was the last time that we had an OSHA inspection? When there's all these things that are problems, right? And at their core, they are a problem that need to be solved. And if they're not solved and you don't think that they're a problem, they are going to very, very quickly become a problem. So when we're talking about, again, the transfer from being a veteran to being a business person, it's identifying those problems. And, And most of the time, you can narrow those down to three things, right? And, and those three things are different for everybody. But if you can narrow them down to three things and then you can narrow the accomplishing of those tasks down to three individual tasks and go three layers deep. So you go three and then you have three things that are nine and then now those nine things have three and you're 27, right? So if you can narrow it down to those 27 problems every single day, you will be running an effective, efficient operation. So now go back to the service side of things and we say, who's really suited to 
be given 27 tasks in a day and for them to accomplish those 27 tasks in a day. Well, probably somebody who spent the better part of their adult life, whether it was from 18 to 21 or 18 to 30 or 18 to 40, right? Doing exactly that. Now it's going to take a little bit of time to get them used to whatever the process is in order to accomplish those 27 things. But if you can, if you can break your day down into 27 tasks and accomplish each one of them in order that is contingent on the other, you're in great shape and you're going to have an efficient operation. And then you can actually look at what it takes to, to grow and become, um, in a position to be able to scale appropriately or however you want to do it. So when we talk about problem solving in the military, it's exactly that. It is giving somebody, I know I have to get up at X amount of time so I can shower, so I can shine my boots, so I can iron my uniform. And now they don't even have to do that, right? Um, hell, half the time now they don't even have to shave. Most of these guys have beards and uh, shaving profiles or religious exemptions or whatever, and good on them, right? I'm not hating on that at all. Uh, being a bearded person myself, I wish that I could have had a beard when I was in. It would have made my life a lot easier. But nonetheless, they have to plan and triage their own day. They have to be able to create um, a process to be able to solve all these problems. So when these things that come up that were unexpected, when these things come up that were uh, not planned for, they have more brain power and more bandwidth to be able to absorb these things and then now try to find a way to effectively accomplish that task because all the other tasks are on autopilot. The 27 things that they want to do every day they have to be accomplished every day are on autopilot. It's on muscle memory. These guys are going to be able to do these things. So then insert, I'll give you a really good example. I remember one day I was on my way to PT at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and a fence got broke down on the interstate and there was cows all over the highway. And when we got to formation, there was a bunch of us that were late and we told the platoon sergeant that there was cows. And he said, there's no way, there's no way there's cows on the interstate. And he smoked all of us for an hour, you know, whatever. And then Later that day, he was reading the newspaper and on the front of the newspaper was fence broke down, hundreds of cows across I-24 in Clarksville, Tennessee, so on and so forth. Now, he doesn't need to come and apologize to us. We're not sensitive, right? We're, we're all living in that space where um, that's just who it is. That's, what, that's your job in the military is to just do what you're told and find creative ways to solve problems so you can minimize the amount of work that you have to do. Um, but it also applies when, when we put guys in, in high pressure situations. So the civilian world's version of a high pressure situation is a lot different. And you hear a lot of guys that were in the service, especially guys who went to combat, they'll come out and they say, well, nobody's shooting at me, so it's okay. You can apply that school of thought to a lot of things. Um, it doesn't have to be so extreme that death is the alternative, right? Um, I've seen people who can juggle a hundred things and there's always that one thing that's the tipping point for them. And when you're in a leadership position in a company, you have to be able to, one, internalize that for yourself and say, okay, this is, this is a space that I'm going to need to bring somebody in to do. Um, and me personally, I love hiring veterans for exactly that reason, because if I'm lacking in an area, I, can, I know that there is a veteran out there that I can give that task and they're going to they're gonna make it a point to find a way to solve that problem and so that it does not end up back on my plate. Right. So I want to find guys like that. And then I want to, I want to see them grow. I want to see them become, um, better leaders and better decision makers. And I want to see them apply those skills that they learned in service into the normal corporate landscape because it's, it's new, it's new to them. They're getting to see a space that they never got to see in the first place before. And now they're getting to take some of the skills that they had and apply them into, into a space that quite frankly, a lot of times can probably benefit in a large, large way from their ability to do these things. So I want to see these people grow. And, and as, as business people and, and hiring authorities for a lot of uh, different job sets and job skills, I think a lot of times we have to look past what's on the paper because nobody's telling you. Nobody's resume is full of things that they do like not good, right? Everybody's resume is let me tell you about all the things that I did great. One of the th things I used to do with my guys, every time I got a new soldier in, I would say, okay, it's Wednesday, let's just say. I say, uh, by tomorrow morning, I need you to give me three things that, that you were really good at. And then they would come in, they'd give me those three things. And then I would say, you have till Monday to give me three things that you know you can improve on. And it's super hard for these guys to be able to come up with three that they're not good at. So 
That is the end of the third segment. My name is Daniel Robowski. This is Boots to Business. I'll see y'all in a few. We now return to Boots to Business with Daniel Robowski. And welcome back. This is Daniel Robowski, and you are listening to Boots to Business. Um, this portion of Boots to Business is brought to you by Golden Temple Builders. Golden Temple Golden Temple Builders brings decades of expertise to commercial renovations and remodeling. Um, we guarantee that we'll provide a clear written pricing option tailored to your project, and you can visit us at goldentemplebuilders.com for details or call 321-508-0815. Let's build your vision together, serving Florida, Texas, and Louisiana. So we left the tail end of the last segment talking about problem solving. And uh, while we were on the break, I got a little bit of really cool information here that I want to pass along to everybody. So we're talking about, and and I think we kind of may have hit the nail on the head a little bit uh, when I was talking to Melissa, that a lot of service members transition really well into the skills, the skills jobs, right? It's the the trades. It's going to be electricians and plumbers and construction folks and roofers and concrete guys, whatever, right? And there is just now here in Florida, 170,000 jobs in the clean energy category. Um, this is a space that I think a lot of service members would would thrive. Uh, if you'd like to take some time and go look at that, it is at www.thecleanenergyplan.com. Uh, I think there's probably some really good information on there. There's probably an abundance of jobs that can be looked at and applied for. And just remember, if you are a service member and you are applying for those jobs, to take the time to mold your resume, make it um, make it focus on your ability to be a good member of a team, your leadership stuff, if you if you have experience in that space. Um, if you were in one of the more skills related jobs in the service, like I was a quartermaster, so I'm going to, I'm going to convey to people that from an operational perspective, I understand things. I understand the logistics of things. I understand, uh, procurement and I understand setting budgets. And these are things that I learned directly from my time in service as a quartermaster. So if you are, you know, if you were an aircraft mechanic, you can switch those skills around and, and make sure that they apply to the job that you're applying for. If you were a tank mechanic, if you were a truck driver, if you were, um, insert whatever, whatever of the 260 some odd jobs the army has. And I don't, couldn't even tell you how many jobs the, the other branches have. I know from a technical job standpoint, the Navy and the air force just set the standard. I mean, there's so many, um, jobs that transition statistically transition out into the civilian world into very high paying jobs. Um, so that's something that, to focus on when you're when you're looking at these things and and understand that your skill set in the service, while you may have a specific job category or job type in mind, it may not be uh, it may not be available, and you may be really well suited for another space. I use myself as an example. I got out, and the first job that I had when when I got out of the military was driving trucks for FedEx. And I said, when I say driving trucks, I mean the delivery truck in rural Kentucky. And it was the, it was one of the worst, um, during the summer, it was okay. In the winter, it was awful. Um, I had a manual transmission box truck. It was the only one in our fleet. And you can imagine driving through rural Kentucky and with a stick shift truck with a parking brake that may or may not work full of people's Christmas presents, especially in the winter and trying to huck trampolines up people's driveways and put them on porches. And it was, it was awful. Um, but I was kind of fell victim to the same thing that a lot of guys do when they get out is, well, this is, I just need to take whatever job I can. Right. And so I did, and I made 500 bucks a week and my family struggled to put groceries on the table. And we, we just struggled in general putting, you know, it was, it was in that time frame in our life where you're like, I'm only going to put 20 bucks in gas in my car. Right. And I'm going to stretch that out as far as I possibly can. Um, I moved from there into logistics and I became a, an operations manager for a logistics company. And we were moving car parts around from Texas to Louisiana. And I said to myself, this is nowhere near where my skill set lies, but I'm good. I'm, I'm good in this space. It makes sense. I can, I can apply the things that I've learned here into this space. Um, and then eventually moved into construction. And I was an operations manager for a large water mitigation company. And we did um, property insurance claims post hurricanes and post tornadoes. And um, we got to a point where 
some laws changed and there were some statute changes and we had to, we were kind of stuck in the space where we couldn't argue certain things without getting ourselves in, in legal trouble. So then I said, all right, well now next evolution. And now, and then I became a public adjuster. I had my own firm and then I transitioned over and merged with a larger firm, which is here in Florida is coastal claim services. And that's all we do. We do thousands of insurance claims every year. So if you would have asked me what 2012, so 11 years ago, when I got out of the military, it, what I thought I would be doing and what I thought my skill set would put me into, it would have never in a million years been the somehow in operations in a public insurance adjusting firm that handles property insurance claims. I say all of that to, to impress upon anybody who may be listening, who's sitting here going, well, I was in the military and I don't know how to translate my skills. Your skills translate. That's, that's the underlying current here. That is the bottom line is that your skills translate into business. You just haven't figured out how they do yet. And probably one of the most predominant skill sets that service members have is that we talked about in the first segment is the adaptability portion of who they are. I can plug 10 dudes I was in the army with into random different jobs across the country and they're going to excel because they're task oriented because they can take direction with, without taking it personally. They can give advice. They can give direction. They can teach people. They want to be, they want to be around when people's successes happen. The biggest thing that I was taught very, very early was, you know, you're always training your replacement. You always want, if your people that you're bringing up are not better than you when you get done with them, you've failed. That applies in every industry, in every company, no matter where you work, no matter where you live. If you are in a position to positively impact people, that's what you should be doing. There's no room for gaslighting people. There's no room for keeping somebody under a lock and key because you're afraid that you're going to lose them. There's no room for anything but growth. And if you can facilitate growth in somebody, you're not just affecting it for them. You're affecting it for their family, their wife, their kids, their husband. It doesn't matter. You're, there's a ripple effect that comes along with that. And those are just, I mean, we're just talking about things from a leadership perspective. These are, these are general leadership principles. You're, you're always wanting to, to watch people grow. That's the whole point. If that's not what you're doing, I, I'm not really sure, you know, kind of why you're in the position that you're in. And if, you, if you're in that position, there's a few things that you need to be really good at doing. One of those things is, is communication. If you can't effectively communicate your goals, your visions for the company, the expectations, the confines for that job that, that somebody's applying for, a veteran or not, if you can't effectively communicate what those things are, how are we how are we going to expect then people to thrive in that space? How are we going to expect them to achieve their 27 things? So if I'm trying to inspire a team and I'm trying to help build and nurture relationships and I'm trying to convey ideas to people, regardless of, of their position in the company or regardless of where they came from, if I can't communicate those things effectively, I'm failing. Okay. And, and that's something I think that a lot of people struggle with because it's easy, it's easy to think it, it's hard, harder to convey it out to people in a, in a manner that they may not understand it. And sometimes you have to be able to read the room. Sometimes you have to be able to say, okay, I understand that maybe what I'm saying isn't coming across the way that I need it to, but this is the goal. This is how we're going to achieve these things. And this is what needs to happen to do it. Um, I always used to joke when I was in, we all, we'll start at Barney and we'll end at Einstein, right? So I'm going to start in a very simple, effective manner until I see and gauge how people are understanding things. And then we're going to grow and evolve from there. And I want people to be successful. So if I leave you with anything today, First off, I want to say thank you for listening to the episode. Um, I look forward to seeing and hearing from anybody's feedback. We'll be back next week. Leaving a positive impact on people never hurts you. It never hurts to do it. So leave a positive, lasting impact on people. My name is Daniel Robowski. This is Boots to Business, and I appreciate your time today. Catch up with us next Sunday, 5 o'clock, right here on News Radio.